started. My, uh, thank you all for being here today. My name is Serene. I'm faculty in SJCO and a member of the FLC. I am super excited to have Mariana here as our faculty speaker. Mariana was actually uh, one of the readers for my master's thesis, so this is really excited for me. Um, one, uh, as per usual for these, we'll have the presentation here at the beginning. Please put your questions in the chat and we'll have time to answer them at the end. Um, very excited and we'll make sure that there's a recording of this, uh, hopefully up by tomorrow. And uh, I'll throw it over to Mariana to get started. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here and the Meet the Faculty series. So nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to be talking about my research in Argentina. Uh, I'm from Argentina, but I've been teaching at Prescott College uh, on and on for 10 years. Uh, started in cultural and regional studies and then in environmental studies. I, uh, I'm a conservation biologist by training, but I got my PhD in the University of Arizona where I did also cultural anthropology. So what you will see in what I present now is kind of a, a mix of disciplines and a mix of research and action research and um, activism. And you will think that I'm all over the place. And that's actually true. I'm all over the place. But that's, that's how we need to do work when we try to affect change. <laughs> so let me just start sharing my screen. Okay, let me see if we are good there. There we go. Let me remove this. Okay, is that good? Okay, so I will be talking about the Argentine Chaco, and the idea is to show through this presentation the mutual dependence of the local cultures in biodiversity. And although I teach at Prescott College, I'm also a member of Proyecto Quimilero. It's a project that I created many years ago. And so now it's a multidisciplinary team that is working in this region. I started alone, but then other people started to join me. And now we are a big and active group. So I will be talking in plural. And that's because I'm including all of my colleagues with whom we're doing this work together. So I would like to tell you a little bit about this region of Argentina, the Argentine dry Chaco, that very people know about because people think of Argentina and think about Buenos Aires. They don't know that there's a lot more to Argentina than Buenos Aires. And then I will cover some of the threats that are threatening the ecological, ecological and cultural integrity of the region and the evolution and growth of my research and project. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, we'll start with the Chaco. The Chaco is, it's sure, it's a pair of shoes, and that's what you find if you do a Google search, but it's also an ecoregion, and it's the second largest ecoregion in South America after the Amazon. And strange that nobody knows about that, right? Well, that's one of the problems with, the, with what's happening in this region, is that nobody knows about it. Within the Chaco region, I worked in a smaller region, but still huge, and it's called the Impenetrable. And so everything I'm talking about today is about the Impenetrable. Within the Impenetrable, we have the Chaco and Pecari distribution range. And this is a species that we use in our project as an umbrella species, meaning that when we protect the species, we protect a large habitat because it requires habitats in good conditions. And also it's a very important species for local people. And it's an endemic and endangered species. So we use it also to get more attention. And so that's why our project is called Proyecto Quimilero. Quimilero is the local name for that species. So I started 20 years ago, look at me, I was so young because I was doing cultural anthropology. I used ethnographic methods to do my research and biological methods. So I spent a cumulatively about two years visiting the area and living with the local people and traveling all over the place, 
I got funding for my research from the CITES Authority from uh, Italy and Switzerland. So I bought a truck and I went all over the place in this region. It's really, really large and distances are large from house to house. I visited families are in very remote areas. And the idea was to get to learn to know the social ecological system and learn how people live, how they interact with their environment. I became friends with many of these families and something that they will do when you visit them as an honor to use, invite you to eat a whole armadillo all by yourself. As a vegetarian, that was a little hard, but I, I forgot about my being vegetarian for two years and enjoy eating armadillos. 20 years later, I'm still in the region and I love the fact that I've been able to stay and work in the same region for so long and now bring my family. So this area is kind of hard. It's hard to live in there because it doesn't rain and it's really hot. It rains a little bit and it all, only rains a couple months in the year and then it's really dry. And so the local people are obviously adapted and have found ways to live there. And that's why it's interesting to get to know this area because it's hard. Like I would not be able to live there because I wouldn't know how to. But local people are very, very in tune with their environment and they, they depend uh, tightly on their environment for their survival. When it rains and in some part of the forest where it hasn't been altered a lot, it's really beautiful. And it has very high biodiversity. There are many species that are endemic to the Chaco. Some species that are in danger of extinction in other parts of the range, they survive in this area. And not because they are in national parks or protected areas, it's because they live with the people and the people use them, but so far it has been in a sustainable way. Just as an example, there are 10 species of armadillos and they're so cute. Like, look at this one, fairy armadillo. And then there's a giant armadillo. So it's, it's really amazing from a biodiversity, biological perspective. It's also the only place where we have three species of peccaries coexisting. There are also many different indigenous groups. There are 17 groups. Most of them live in Paraguay and Bolivia. In Argentina, there is one large group, the Wichi. In Paraguay, there is a group that still has uh, not been contacted. In Argentina, the Wichi are the largest group and they are the ones with whom we work. So I will be talking about them throughout the presentation. Then there's the Criollos. They don't define themselves as indigenous people, but they are like mestizos, so mixed um, Spaniards and indigenous people, but they call themselves Criollos. They are subsistence farmers and they inhabit most of the region. So I will be talking about the Wichi and the Criollos together, at least it's, there's something where they're different. So I wanted to show you this because to give you an idea of how these people live, everything that you see there that is green is forest, like dense forest. The white spots are settlements where these families live. And each settlement might have only one or two houses who are family. So they are spread from each other, from, a distance of about five kilometers from a house to another one. And this is because they have livestock. And so they need space around their house for the livestock to roam free. And also because of they need to hunt. So each family has enough space around them to have hunting grounds. Everything you see in lines are little trails that connect the settlements. And the ones that are more straight are more important roads. The indigenous people live in uh, settlements that are closer together. So the white, why do we see white? Because the soil is bare, it's denuded right next to the houses. And so that's why it looks white in an um, aerial photograph. They clear the vegetation around the house so that they don't have snakes going into their house and they don't have so many uh, bugs. And also because the goats eat everything around the house and the goats come back to the houses at night. This is an, an indigenous settlement, so they will have more houses 
uh, together, several families living together, sometimes up to 20 families. By the way, some of the pictures quality is really bad. It's because I took pictures 20 years ago when we still didn't have digital cameras. These were actual slides, remember those times? And then somehow I had to put them in the computer. So what is it called impenetrable? Sure, it's hard to walk through because it's all thorny forest, but also because there's no water. Um, the water doesn't really collect. So these, the people who live there have found ways to collect water by digging large areas on the ground and then the water collects when it rains and it lasts for as long as it lasts until it rains again. The other reason is because it's very isolated. It's far, there are no roads to get there. There's no electricity, no communication. They really live out there. Um, they have never traveled to big cities and nobody has heard about them. Or if, if you ask someone from Buenos Aires, they might say like, oh yeah, Indians live there, you know, something like that. Nobody knows really what's happening there. Other way to get water is from underground water, but that's not a good water. Generally has high contents of salt and sometimes it has arsenic that makes it poisonous for humans. So it's really hard. And that's why it has pre been preventing more of the development of this region. Here's my friend with whom we did a part of the research together, collecting water for us. This is what we will drink during our field trip. And believe it or not, I never got sick from drinking that water, interestingly. The indigenous women, the witchy, collect water from rivers sometimes, and then they have their own way to filter the water using pottery. Um, but the water from the rivers, you cannot drink straight out because of the animals. And the way to mobilize, to go from place to place and go to towns is with horses, with this type of, type of vehicles. It's really hard to use cars because the roads are impossible when it rains because they are dirt roads. And when it's not raining, the, the dirt is so dry that it's like uh, driving through like quicksand. So they have good ways to move around. And sometimes they do have to go to town and that's what they use to get there. So I mentioned there's no electricity, but some schools and some houses have small solar panels, just enough for some light and for the radio. And so that was something that became important later in the project to know that everyone has a radio, but nobody has TV. So if we wanted to communicate with people, um, we couldn't use phones or the TV, we have to use the radio. There are a few schools in the area. Education is super basic and it gets to seventh grade and that's it. If families want their kids to go to high school, they have to move to a village, to a town or put them in boarding schools. Also the schools are important because they give food to the kids. Land ownership is something that is important to understand now to understand what's happening. So for the Criollos, the government gave them the rights of access to 250 hectares per family. They don't own the title to that, but they can use it. And if they want to acquire the title, they have to pay for it. They, they have to fence their property and they have to build a house with bricks and sink, which is a really bad idea in a, such a hot environment. The Wichi have small communal lands where they're settled. And in addition, the government created some indigenous reserves, but the indigenous people don't even know where those reserves are because it's not where they live. They're far from where they live and they're too small. So it doesn't really help them. They use the land around their houses where they live, which is land that sometimes belongs to the state, sometimes belongs to criollos. Um, it's very confusing who owns the land, and that has created some conflicts between Criollos and Wichi, and between them and government and um, corporations who are moving into their area. So local people rely largely on the forest and wildlife for their daily life. All their construction is made with wood and branches and grasses. It's really nice to see how they built their houses. They're very good for hot weather um, because it keeps them cold and they have system for aeration. So they can be there when it's 10 degrees cooler than outside. That's why it's such a 
terrible idea to ask them to build houses where the roof is made out of sink. Sometimes they do that because they want to get the title to their land, but they don't live in those houses. They also uh, need to collect firewood. All their cooking is done, done with firewood in different ways. All their fences for their corrals is made with wood. They don't use wire, so they're very uh, self-sustained. They do just some basic logging once in a while. Some families, when they need to get some cash, they will cut down some trees, turn them into posts for fencing and sell them. Sometimes if they need flat cash, they will go to town and either bring a cow with them or fence posts to sell and get cash to buy something. They collect um, honey from wild species. And a very important species for them is this tree that is like a mesquite, it's the same genera. And they uh, use a flower out of the mesquite that they save during the year to use in cases of emergency when they don't have enough food. The witchy women also collect some plants from which they use the fibers and they use the fibers in many different ways. They can even make clothing with that or other things, um, crafts that sometimes they sell and gives them a little extra source of income. So they're all based on a subsistence economy, meaning they produce just enough for self-consumption. They don't sell what they produce. And very small areas where they can open and grow some corn and sometimes squash. Using old technology is very appropriate for their place. And livestock, it's important for them. Um, they cannot fence their livestock because their properties are too small to have enough livestock. The cows can only eat what they find in the forest. They don't grow food for the cows. So they can eat leaves and um, even bark when it's periods of scarcity. Sometimes a cow might move uh, a thousand kilometers, sorry, a thousand hectares to get enough food along a year. So the 250 hectares that they are allowed to have is very small. That's why they have open range. This is typical in other uh, arid and semi-arid regions in the world. Cattle is also very important for them as a saving. That's like their capital. In the way that we put money in the bank, they have cows. And so their wealth is measured in the number of cows that they have. And if they need cash in an emergency, a kid gets sick, they will go to town, walk in with a cow or two, sell them and use them cash. So they try to not eat their cows. Occasionally they do. They do get milk from their cows and make cheese, and that also gives them an extra source of income if they need to sell cheese. If they do kill a cow, they use everything. There's only one gland that I don't remember what it is that they throw. Everything else is used. It's amazing to see that. Everything for horses, um, what you can see there is made with the, the heights, the cows, their beds are made with wood and cow hides. But their main source of food is goats. And it's the job of the girls to take care of the goats. And that's what gives them the food. Um, often, the only thing they have to eat is a big piece of goat. They also have some sheep. And they use the sheep for making blankets. It does get cold in the winter. And sometimes they might sell occasionally a blanket or two. So here I want to show you what our project was and how it has been changing through time. So I started in year 2000. The idea was to learn more about the local use of wildlife and the conservation status of wildlife, because that's what the Argentinian government hired me for. Then the structural adjustments happened. And so while I was doing my research, so I changed the focus to understand what was happening uh, in the local cultures and biodiversity. 2009, I started to work with a PhD student. I was her advisor and now she's the, the other person leading the project. And we wanted to learn more about how to empower local communities to defend their environment and what's the best education approach to reach these communities. And then we've been working since 2012 on mobilizing rural and urban citizens, empower local communities, through developing capacity, uh, training people in research as educators and training them in property rights and land use laws 
and I'll talk more about that. Validating traditional ecological knowledge and creating an environmental social education program that was co-created with them. Join human rights groups, develop uh, united strategies, develop collaboration with environmental lawyers and bring national and international at attraction, uh, attention and attract media coverage. So we'll be talking a little bit about everything that you see in this slide. Started with analysis of hunting. What are people eating? How much they depend on wildlife? Um, it was a collaborative research in the sense that the local hunters participated in the research. They collected what they hunted. They put tags to all the schools of the animals that they hunted. That, that allowed me to see what species they were hunting, the age of the individuals. They also kept hunting journals where they would write what day, what species they hunted and where, how far from the house. The kids in the house, the older kids who know how to write, helped by collecting information and what kind of meat they consumed every day. So that allowed me to then compare how much of that comes from wildlife and how much from their domestic animals. And we kept these records for an entire year. That was a ton of information. And at the same time, we're doing more like scientifically standard methods to assess wildlife abundance with transects and camera traps. The first publication was an understanding, an in-depth understanding of the use of wildlife and, and the role that wildlife plays in, in this region. Then working with my other colleagues, the first one, Michaela was my student who is now uh, leading the project. We compare between the two cultures and to try to understand how they live in the same place and use similar resources and what are their different perceptions of wildlife. And we continue doing that kind of research to better understand how they're similar and different, because if you want to implement a conservation strategy, you really have to understand how the cultures use and perceive um, wildlife. What we found is both cultures have different perceptions and different hunting techniques, but they use wildlife in similar ways and for many different purposes. What you see there is a hat made with the skin of an anteater. Apparently this is a very good skin, it's thick and flexible. The skin of peccaries is used for making other things like saddles, but mostly they use it for food. And we found that between 20, 20 and 50% of their meat consumption, consumption comes from wildlife. That's, that's a lot, considering that they eat meat every day, like sometimes only meat. But we also find that even though they eat a lot of species, 15 species of mammals, seven species of birds, and two species of reptiles, most of their food came from two species, armadillos and rabbits, which is good because these species reproduce a lot. So their hunting is mostly sustainable. And that's why they have been able to live there for so long. And still wildlife was there and it was abundant until recently. But we did see that some species, in this case, the chacon peccary, were declining rapidly. But the reason was not hunting. Hunting was not, and they were not over harvesting, but because they were losing habitat. So then the question is, why is, is there so much um, loss and degradation of habitat? Well, it started in 2002. There were several macroeconomic events that happened during that year. Argentina went into an economic crisis and that happens because of the international monetary fund structural adjustments that were implemented in the country. The national currency devaluation which led to an increased value of products for export. And I will explain this a little more. This will be a crash course on structural adjustment programs for those who are not familiar. What this is, is the International Monetary Fund lends money to countries. When a country cannot pay, they make these adjustments with the intention that the country earns enough money in dollars to be able to pay back the debt. So the country is obligated to implement these measures. What these measures do is increase, increase exports of primary products 
such as wood, agriculture, livestock, mining. Reduce government expenditures on public sector, that would be let's put in less money in education, health and infrastructure, and attract multinational investors. So this happened in Argentina in 2001. It has happened in many Latin American countries and other countries too, since about the 80s, all the way until now, it keeps happening. So what happened in the Chaco? This all of a sudden increased the value of agricultural products for export. And that led to an increased value of land. Now all of a sudden people have interest in buying land in the Chaco to grow more crops to sell to other countries. That led to an increased privatization of the land by non-local people who were coming in and trying to buy the land. And that led to increase in rapid deforestation. So how did privatization happen? So I mentioned earlier, local peasants can acquire the title, they're allowed to, but only up to a thousand hectares. And it's hard for them to do that because even though it's, the land is very cheap, they still don't have the cash. Non-locals, however, can purchase any size. And most of the lands that was purchased during that time were huge portions of land, like 30,000 hectares. So what do they do? They buy the land, they immediately fence their property, they kicked out all of the livestock that belongs to the local people, and, and then they will work the land. So the locals who used to have their livestock roaming free in the forest all of a sudden see that they don't have enough space for their livestock. So they have to either sell cows or the cows just died out of starvation. The new owners immediately take down the forest. They don't even sell the wood because it's not worth enough for them. What they want to do is burn what uh, is left. What you see there in the left is um, a field that has been recently burned and the forest on the other side. And then they grow soybeans. They replace the forest with soybeans. So who are these new owners? You might recognize some of the names. They're not really people, they are agribusinesses. They are large multinational corporations. Many of these corporations were before in Brazil, um, but because of a lot of uh, international pressure, these companies moved out of Brazil and moved into Paraguay and Argentina, where there is not much international pressure. So as I said earlier, nobody knows about the Chaco. Argentina increased the production of soybeans a lot, from a 3% in the 70s to 63% of the cultivated area is now soybean. Why do we are, are growing so much soy? Because of the increased demand for animal protein in China, Europe, and the US. Soybean is used to make food for livestock. It's not consumed as much for tofu. So vegetarians don't worry about that. It's the meat eaters who should worry about that. <laughs> so let's remember again what the landscape looked like, right? Each white spot is a house. They have their livestock moving around. They have enough place for hunting. They had a harmonious way of living for hundreds of years. This is a satellite image now. What you see in the right where it says Chaco, those little white dots, that's the area where I work. This was 10 years ago, and this is now. Deforestation is very, very fast. It's the fastest deforestation rate in the world right now. It looks like this. It's obviously an environmental disaster. It leads to salinization, loss of biodiversity, floods, droughts, all the problems you can imagine. But it's also a human tragedy because all this land that is now being cleared used to be the home of the Criollos and the Huichi. 12.4 million acres are now converted into soybeans and people are literally being displaced because they don't own the land. Sometimes there are stories of Huichi saying like they heard noise, they wake up, they go out to see what's going on and they see these machines just going through the forest in their backyard and they don't understand who they are, why are they there? They don't understand, then they might say like, well, we own this land, we bought it, and they don't know. 
a lot of this lack of information and understanding of property rights, it's what these companies are taking advantage of. So that's something that we later started to work on is trying to learn more about property rights and educate the local people about what their rights are. So what happens to the people who live there? How did it affect their subsistence economy? There's less grazing area, so less cattle. That means it that increased the vulnerability and food insecurity. There's increased poverty, an increased need for wildlife as food because they don't have enough space for goats or cattle. And at the same time, there's decreased hunting grounds. For wildlife, the problem is, while well, they're losing habitat and there is more hunting because locals don't have enough food. So they need to depend more on wildlife. Also, because people now realize that they don't own the land and that anyone can come and take the land and say that it's theirs, all this confusion of our property rights makes them, gives them an incentive to exploit what they have left, to sell as much as they can and leave the area because they don't know when it's going to be their turn to lose everything they own. So what we learned during this part of the research that led us to the future part of the research was there is now massive deforestation. The poorest people are being forced to leave the region. The environmental de degradation decreases the diversity, increases poverty and destroys the local cultures. So the, mess, the best way that we found to defend both the local cultures and biodiversity was to work with the communities and to empower local communities to defend themselves. When I finished my dissertation, I wrote a book in Spanish uh, that I wanted to bring back to the communities because I wanted people to learn about my research. And so I brought it back to every family who had participated. They loved it. They were super excited to see the book. But I noticed that they were most excited about the pictures that I had put in the book. They weren't really reading much what I wrote and they weren't understanding it. And then I thought, of course, because I still wrote it as an academic, um, as a scientist. I wasn't really able to write it in a way that was accessible. So it did serve some of my purposes, but not completely. So I was thinking next time this should be written in a different way. And so, and we'll get to that part later. In 2016, I did organize an international meeting with people from three countries that share the Chaco, Bolivia, Paraguay, and Argentina. And we invited also participants from other countries that would help us to facilitate the meeting. And the idea was to try to come up with um, a common vision for what we want for the Chaco in the future and to share experiences of what is happening. So we invited people from government, Mennonites that live in, in Paraguay, indigenous peoples, leaders, criollos, researchers, NGOs, universities, and zoos. I got funding to pay for tickets for everybody. We put everybody in a hotel and we were there for five days, intensive five days working all day, sharing experiences, coming up with a common vision. It was really an incredible experience. It was especially incredible to listen to criollos and indigenous and here you see in the right side is an indigenous leader, Wichi, and the right is a criollo. And to give them the space and the microphone to be able to tell us their experience, what they know, what they want for their future, that was really uh, fundamental for this meeting. These people have never left their village. It was the first time getting in a bus, the first time traveling to another country, first time in a hotel. It was an incredible experience for them. But it's all, it was probably intimidating, but it was also great for them to see that they were not alone, that they had a lot of other people who were interested. And so these people went back to their communities and talk with everybody and say, we're not alone, we can fight this. We don't have to just give up and move to live in the poverty belts of the cities. 
we had working groups with people from different backgrounds. It was a, a really great experience. And what we concluded from that meeting was that we needed to better understand wildlife use and trends. And that's something that they wanted to learn, the Wichi and the Criollos, because they depend so much on wildlife. We needed to strengthen the local capacities, especially train them in property rights and land use laws. We wanted more attention from the media. We needed to link property rights and conservation, and mobilize and organize local people, and join forces with other organizations. So we went back with all of these results, which give us like a road, a map to know where we're going and what we need to do. We started with creating a wildlife monitoring and educational program that we co-created with local people. They wanted to learn how wildlife is doing because they don't want to overhunt, but they don't have ways to know it. So we train them in the use of computers, cameras, GPS, maps. And after they got to learn all of this, uh, we did several trainings with wildlife monitors from different communities. They, each community chose one or two people in the case of the witches that will be doing that. We needed to adjust the, our different understandings of space and the, the geography of the place because the way we look at a map and the way they look at space is completely different. So that took some adjustments until we calibrated our methodologies. And then we went ahead and they started practicing and it was incredible the amount of information that they collected that they're still collecting for themselves. So then they get together and discuss what to do. Um, here they're collecting information. Once we all had standardized the method, uh, they started to do it by themselves. We did Wichi, we had to work separate and a little different because for them, everything is consensus based. They all need to agree with things. So it took several meetings, every, all the community comes together and we design the research tools together. Um, they also have different interpretation of what species are. So they decided to work with figures of the animals instead of with the names of species. And they have their hunting grounds that they named in different ways. Once we come up with something, it has to go through the whole community for approval and then they can go ahead and work. We also train some of them in using um, cameras that take pictures of wildlife that we later use for research and also for educational material. Here we're showing them the results from the camera traps and it's very exciting for them to see that even though they live there, it's different when they see the animals in a picture in a computer. One of the papers that came out of this was the experience of how this process work, all the uh, participatory monitoring, how it worked, how effective it was and the different techniques that we use. And by now, if you see the first author is, was my PhD student. We also use this information to compare the way that they collect data with the more scientific ways of uh, camera traps and um, transects. Some of the things we found from that research, if you look at number two, is that these methods contribute to build local capacity because they get trained, they get to learn more, they're using cameras and computers. Um, they're better to then use and implement conservation strategies. And they were actually better and more accurate than the, the more standard scientific methods. We also design co-design environmental education because I didn't want to repeat what had happened with the book that I published. We wanted the educational material to be something that they will write by themselves. They would tell us what they want the kids in school to learn and how we will write it. So we started with very simple flyers. Uh, they will design the flyer, then they will show it to the elders. Uh, and once the elders approve it, we'll make the material and then bring it to schools. This is an example of one of the materials that they designed, all written in Wichi, and they told us what they wanted their kids to learn. 
Um, by the way, there's no educational material written in Ouija. The schools are not bilingual and the kids, even though they don't speak Spanish, they have to, everything is in Spanish in their schools. And this is another flyer written in the two languages. They also wanted the kids to know about the importance of the forest because the elders see that the younger people are just taking down the forest and moving away because of the land insecurity. So if you look at here at the red section, it says, don't let them cheat you. El monte, the forest, is wealth. To cut down trees, it's not progress. It brings misery. So this was an important message that they wanted the young people to get. We also wanted to train local people to do environmental education because that's not something that should depend on people from outside. So this person on the right, Hugo, you will see him in many pictures. He's a local, he became involved with the project and now he's the director of the local operations. And he moved to one of those villages and he's living there. So um, when I went there in 2018, we created uh, the, the talks and developed a system for environmental education, contacted the school districts, got permission to visit all the local schools. And then Hugo became the educator. Uh, and then ed Hugo educated other people. Here we have visiting the local schools and bringing the material that was co-created. Uh, for the schools, this is great. They love it. You can see that the walls, they don't have a lot of flyers hanging out. So it's just having something colorful, attractive. It's good for them to see in both languages. Um, it gives them more legitimacy to their language. And then we have been training other local people to also be the environmental educators. If you see here on the left, he used to be one of our wildlife monitors. And you see that he's in the picture, right? In the screen, wearing the same jacket. That, that was just by chance. I guess he always wears that jacket, <laughs> but he's there. Uh, and he's getting learning on how to give talks so that he would be doing that. And we have obtained uh, screens and projectors and computers for them to visit schools and give talks. To show the kids the pictures that we obtained with the camera traps, it's something that kids love because the kids don't get to see animals very much. So that's also helps them to fall in love with their environment and with their species and gain more respect. And so that's how it goes. Hugo or the other um, and educators visit schools, give talks, show pictures, and this way people are, the kids are getting more involved. This is Lisindo, who we'll, we'll meet later again. He's he, here giving a talk about his own change of heart from a hunter to a conservationist. He still hunts, but he wants to conserve the forest so that he can continue hunting and his kids can continue hunting because that's their way of life but he calls himself now a conservationist. So kids are getting more involved in understanding the problems with deforestation and how it affects them. And that's the idea is to get everybody involved so that they don't just feel victims, but they can take some action in their hands. And now Hugo and Lisino are on their own, developing their own environmental um, education talks and programs and they visit the schools and they're on their own. We already left them. We don't need to be supervising. Something that people don't understand is where their properties are. The Wichi have no idea where their indigenous reserve is, where their property is, what is not property. So when we gave them the GPS for two years, they took data points when they went hunting. And then we collected all of that information that allow us to see where they're actually using the forest. It has nothing to do with the reserves that the government gave them. So that allows us in, and them to request property rights of the land that they actually use. Also, Argentina has very complicated land use laws. And so we don't understand them. We have a hard time. We need someone to explain it to us and then we try to explain it to them. But that's super important for them to understand so that they can know 
when someone is doing something illegal, they know now who to call. Um, the same which he have formed their own police, they're called guards, so that they know when to make calls and get the police involved. We also wanted to bring kids from the cities, even within the Chaco, the large city, the capital, people there don't know about the impenetrable. Um, so we wanted to bring those people into the forest and help them to experience the nature and experience the cultures. So we bring them to meetings with the local people, they get to eat their food. We also interact with the park rangers. And so that's helping kids from the cities who might have more power to protest and mobilize in the future to, to learn about their own part of their territory that is it's very far from them. In the villages, we noticed also that the young people were not very interested and they should think about their future as something that they have to move out of the region and go to the city. So getting them involved in the protection and the fight was very important. We invited our local artists and they're now working on making murals. They design their murals and then they paint walls in the buildings um, in the different villages. They were so excited with this mural that they kept working all night long. And then the, by the next day, they had their mural. It was beautiful. And they were doing the same in different villages. So that artists who are working with us and they just give them some, some ideas of how to do the murals, but they, then the young people do that by themselves. The relationship between local people and park rangers has always been a um, hostile relationship because in the old times, the parks were imposed without any particip participation. And so we want to break that relationship and make it more of a collaborative relationship. So we have organized educational camps where the young people of the region go into the national parks and we do activities together with the park rangers. They stay overnight in camps and there's this very friendly, completely new type of interaction between the local people and park rangers. The idea is to really get the National Park Service um, to develop ecotourism that will be based on the local people so that the locals can get profits from tourism. This is especially important because there's a new national park created there to protect the impenetrable. And we want all the local families to be able to participate and receive benefits from this. And so, and that's working really well. We also wanted to value local ecological knowledge. And what we started with was conversations with the local people. We, for example, with this person here uh, with the hat, we realized that he knows a lot about frogs. And so we were like, okay, let's go ahead and work with frogs. He told us everything he knows about frogs. We recorded all the information. He also took pictures, we gave him the camera, he took pictures, and then we put it, all of that into a book. Um, he's the author of the book. And the book looks like this inside. It has pictures of the frogs that he took, has the scientific information, and the information that he told us about their behavior, uh, their ecology, and their biology. We showed this to um, amphibians experts in the country, and they were amazed by the amount of knowledge that these people have. And also, they learned a lot that they didn't know about the behavior of these uh, frogs. So here is Lisindo reading the book. We printed about a thousand books. Um, we brought it to all the schools, national parks, all the protected areas, and we gave hard for them to Lisindo, and he sells them, makes profit with his own, selling his own knowledge. And he's been invited by different radios and news. He has been in the news because he's the first local criollo who wrote a book. We continue with the same idea and this time we wanted to focus on another other species um, and we selected the peccaries because they are very important species for them in terms of food and also culturally and with the same methodology 
We recorded information. They told us a lot about the species. We work with three hunters, Lisindo, Claudio, and Genaro. We put everything in a book. Here's Claudio reading the book. They are the authors. And here are the other two authors, Lisindo and Genaro. This book now is great and it does everything that I couldn't do when I wrote my dissertation as a book because it's written with their own language. We respected their way of, of talking, their style. It's very different from what I would have written if I was writing this. And so people can read it, relate to it, understand it, and they're so eager to read it and so excited. And it's not just about the precaries, but also about how they feel and what's happening. So here I translated a little bit of what it says here. I'm afraid that wildlife here will disappear. These people come and take the wood and take everything. They do that because they have money. They won't stop deforesting because they are greedy. They want our Chaco to be like a farmland. Another part it says, I want the future of the impenetrable to be like it is now. No electricity, no roads. There should be no deforestation. The animals will have no food. Something interesting here is that when we look at this area and say, oh, they're so poor, there's no electricity or roads. Well, they have a different idea and they actually prefer it that way. They see the advancement of pavements and electricity as something that's going to destroy their way of life. And they also see deforestation as taking away wildlife and they need wildlife for food. So having this information in this book and this book being distributed among all the schools, elementary and high schools, everywhere in the Chaco and to people um, outside of schools, it gives them a, a conversation. People can relate to it. They're like, oh, I feel the same way. Oh, this is happening. You know, so it's not just about pecaries, it's about their vision of what's happening and their vision for the future and what they would like. And so this has helped people to communicate with each other. It has also made a little bit of a shift in power relationships because now park rangers are reading books written by the local criollos who are generally regarded as ignorant because they didn't go to school and they don't speak proper Spanish. And local people are so proud that someone from their community has written a book. It has brought them so much pride about themselves and about the environment where they live in because they see that it's, it's something that is valued by others from the outside. But we wanted this information to go farther than from the impenetrables. So we recorded and made videos of them talking, talking about wildlife and talking again about the forest and their way of life. And uh, with Iwichi, we also did that. Um, in this case, this is an, an indigenous leader of one of the groups who says, we use that forest to hunt and collect fruit or get honey. Now life has become impossible. When you have them talking, to the camera and then we put this out in YouTube, it has become very powerful because people from the rest of Argentina are getting to know what's happening. Otherwise they wouldn't know. We also wanted to do something bilingual and for the younger kids. Again, we focus on our umbrella species, the Chacon Peccary, and it was written in the two languages. Um, a big team of people participated in this. We included Hugo, who is a local person, Lisindo, also local, and two in Wichi young men who help with the translation, and a group of people who work in education. So we created this book. Um, the idea with the book was also to show the local culture and to show, in this case, that who protects Wildlife is not just the park rangers, it's everybody together. That's why you see an witchy kid there. And in this case, a witchy woman doing her crafts. So it gives them again, um, um, makes their, their protection of wildlife. It legitimizes their use and their protection of wildlife. So an example we'll see here is the question is, what do we need to survive? And what it says is we need for the people who have lived here 
to continue living here and use their territories in a sustainable way. So it's saying we need them here. And this is what kids are going to be reading rather than what we need is protected areas. The book was already published and presented um, at the Capitol with um, yeah, the National Book Fair with a mascot. Um, and then we wanted to get also more information across. So we funded the creation of a radio that is bilingual and it's led by a um, witchy person and Hugo again, the local person who is now like in charge of the project in the region. And he is a, a witchy person. They create their program. They decide what to put in the program, what to talk about. And it's also a place for the local people to communicate with. When If they see a bulldozer coming, they will tell them, we see this in this place. They will immediately say that in the radio and everybody now is listening to the radio. And so that the news get through very quickly, something that we couldn't do otherwise. We couldn't do it by phone because very few people have phones. We also wanted to get more um, international news. So when I did the meeting in Paraguay, I called this group, the Mongabai, which is an online environmental news to write about what was happening. And then Mongabai became very interested in the situation. And since 19, 2017, they have been writing news about the Chaco, almost at least one article a year. This also helps to bring other medias interested in the place. And so we have the New York Times writing about it. Um, we also, uh, wrote a paper about to bring attention about the Chakwan Pekka in particular, and then the Mangabai wrote an article about that. The Guardian also wrote an article, and there's a lot. Like right now, if you do a Google search, you won't get the shoes anymore. You might get information about what's happening in the region. We also created a group that is called Somos Monte, and that's We Are Forest. This is a group that involves civilians, government people, different NGOs, um, everyone who was interested in doing something, we thought we all have to get together and have one group that will be more um, dedicated to protests and to bring up information. So this group is super active in social media and continuously showing pictures and videos of deforestation, illegal deforestation, calling on the governors, calling on government. It's completely um, codependent, the social justice and then environmental justice. So this group involves people from um, um, social organizations and people from groups like um, international survival that are supporting this group. Um, the indigenous, people, especially the witchy, also tell us what they want this group to say. So in this case, I will translate. It says, stop colonization and racism. We are earth, water, forest, oxygen, and spirit. And he talks about how they want autonomy. So from being complete victims, like, I don't know what this bulldozer is doing in my backyard, uh, they're now mobilized. And thus has been really amazing. When they see deforestation in the field, they communicate, the radio talks about it, people gather and protest around the deforestations, around the machines. And at the same time, people in the city, young people who are now more involved, also protest at the same time in front of the government. It's like a very quick call, gather at the government house, stop deforestation. Hugo is also participating in uh, scientific conferences to talk about the experience and what's happening. And one of the witchy young men who started to work with us when he was 16, he's now going to the court every time that there is um, some discussion about property rights and he now understands much better the law and their rights and their properties. And, uh, and so he's trying uh, really hard to fight for the recognition of their, of their land. 
And this is where we are now, still working with lawyers to try to assure property rights. That's the, the most difficult and complicated aspect and the most key aspect. Continue with protests, uh, continue empowering local communities, continue with the locally based social environmental education and continue with the locally based wildlife monitoring. And I just wanted to finish with this picture again because uh, I love this, the people there so much. They're so generous. And if you ever want to go and spend time with them, let me know. So I'll stop sharing and maybe open time for questions. Thank you, Mariana, for that was really, really informative and very, it was just wonderful. It was super uh, exciting to hear about. Folks, this is your, uh, the Prescott College faculty's chance to ask some questions. Um, so if you're Prescott College faculty, you're welcome to stick around for our uh, so-called happy hour. Um, please uh, put your questions in chat or feel free to just speak right up. Um, that was just, that was, that was wonderful. So my brain's just still swimming. Thank you. And I see my mother-in-law, hi Ruth, and Claire, and Bob. <laughs> Catherine, go ahead. Mariana, thank you so much. I was not expecting to laugh and cry um, during that presentation, but I did both. That was just really so powerful um your work and and the way you speak about it and a lot of it resonates um where i'm living now in guatemala my question is i guess fairly elemental but i'm just curious you mentioned as you were developing uh, the instructional materials for younger kids you were working with locals to figure out what they want their children to know and i wonder if you have a little bit of a sense or if you thought about this at all of the extent to which what you would have thought would be important differed from what those local people thought was more important. Right. Yeah, that's great because we have to, I had to like forget about my own views and be like completely open. But at the end it was like, yeah, of course this makes so much sense um, because they see it as we need to protect something that we depend on. It's not let's protect it for the sake of the species, but because we depend on it and our future depends on it. So they put a lot of emphasis on their dependence on their resources, on the forest and on the species. Um, so that was bringing in their, their perspective that I might not have put so much emphasis on. But the main difference is in the way that the material is presented, the, the style of, of the writing style, their talking style, it's as if they are writing their thoughts. It's not a, 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 a writing that has a structure that is organized in the way that we are trained to organize and write our essays. It's, this is not like that. It's more like their thoughts become their, their writing. That's especially for the book um, where the three local authors uh, gave us the information and my job, which took me at a year, was just to organize the information so that there would be a little more flow. For the other one, for the book for the kids, um, they told us what they wanted, but then we wrote that because that was going to be used as an educational material in school, so we did wanted to, to follow some standards in terms of grammar and because it's used to, well, to teach kids also vocabulary, writing, grammar, and writing it in the two languages. Diana, go ahead. Catherine, for that. Yeah, this is such an incredible project. It really is incredible. I love the use of the public particip participatory GIS, right? You had a bottom-up approach where the, the locals took over the elements they thought were important to include, the spaces they thought were important to include. And then you combine that with the monitoring of the wildlife. I'm just curious, have the locals taken more ownership in terms of um, taking rates, uh, provisional resources, 
uh, just to help uh, the community understand a more sustainable uh, use of the resources that they have uh, with all the other pressures on the system, the ecosystem and its services. Um, has the community started to say, oh, you can only take this many peccary, this many bunny? I mean, I'm just curious um, mm -hmm. if, you know, how, how the monitoring approach leads to their use of their natural resources. Yeah, absolutely. That's what they wanted to know because they say, we don't know if we're over harvesting or no. And when I noticed when I did my research in the year 2000 was that people believed that species didn't go extinct, but they will move somewhere else. It's like, the, oh, the animals have just moved away when in fact they were disappearing. So when they realized they're not moving anywhere, they're just disappearing because there's no other place where they can go. That's why they they were like surprised, like obviously they're not moving, then are we over harvesting? We don't want to do that. How can we prevent that? So they wanted this tool to be developed. Um, and with the Wichi, the same, they also want to see where they're hunting and where they find them most of their wildlife because they don't know if that's part of their territory or not. So for them, it was more linked with, is this ours? Are we hunting in our own land or are we hunting in somebody else's land? Like, why are the Criollos coming in and telling us that we have to leave, that this is theirs? We don't know. So by using the GPS, we were able to map where they were hunting, kind of help, help some to solve some conflicts. And the Wichi always had meetings, just social gatherings for different reasons. But now every time they meet, they talk about what they have found. Like, hey, we did the transects last week and we didn't find any peccaries. And so, so it's a conversation, what they're finding because they continue doing the monitoring on their own. And so that helps them to know, are the animals here? Are they not? Maybe we're over hunting. So they, they are making decisions about what species to hunt and what not to hunt, or they are making like seasonal bands that they determine and they implement themselves. So it's helping them tremendously. Um, and if they were able to manage all their territory, this would be like the tool they need. Thank you for that answer, Mariana, um, and that question, Diana. Um, folks, feel free to keep speaking up, keep asking questions. I know that there is a lot to deal with that uh, from there. Catherine, did you want to read that next question you have in the chat up? Sure. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if the government has reacted. Have they made any changes or, or territory updates, borders, whatever, um, based on those data that the Wichi and Criollos are, are providing? Some, but but not enough. And because this this is a very messy situation, right? Because it's this like overlapping ownerships. Because the government was so sloppy in the past to just sell land without really measuring what the land was or doing the, the correct um, titles. Uh, some locals bought their land, others didn't. So it's very, very messy. But all of these protests and movements and the, the Wichi people going to the government and requesting that their lands to be recognized has brought more attention to it. And so they are, rev they are revising the designations of the indigenous reserves to try to see if they can move that, give that land to the Criollos and create reserves where the indigenous people actually live. So it would be like a swapping um, territories. It's going to take time, but, but at least they're moving on it. They're working on it. Um, but it, the things get very complicated when, when you have large corporations involved that move very fast before this slow governmental process. So these corporations buy land and in a week, they have taken down the entire forest, right? So it's a lot faster than the time that the government takes to, to define property rights. That's why the protests in the place are so important because people are actually doing like the Greenpeace approach, standing in front of the bulldozers. I was gonna ask next about have there been any lawsuits up to the Supreme Court or whatever that system is down there? But then you mentioning that they can just go in and level the forest does kind of um, make a lawsuit sort of moot, doesn't it? 
Yeah, and there is, a, as I mentioned, there is a law about land use that is very complicated. Um, and many of these new owners are not respecting that law. So they're getting themselves in trouble with the law without even the, the, our interference. Um, but, but again, they're just so big and powerful that they don't even care if they have a lawsuit against them. And there are other organizations that are working there, like Greenpeace is there, uh, Survival International is there. So hopefully with these groups putting more pressure, we'll be able to stop the very fast advance of deforestation. Unfortunately, with the pandemic in 2020, um, there were fewer eyes outside looking at what was happening and they took advantage of that. And there was a huge peak in deforestation during that year because you know, Argentina went into a full lockdown. Everyone in your house, don't leave your house, which was terrible for the environment. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Um... I'd like to ask about how, it's a kind of a simple basic question. These folks live five, 10 kilometers away by foot or by horse from their nearest neighbors who are often family members. And so much of what you were describing, I'm, I'm talking about the Criollos, uh, so much of what you were describing requires community action and collaboration and, and organizing and things like that. So how, how has their culture in the sense of their their separation, geographical separation from one another, influence their ability to organize quickly and effectively? Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, I wrote a scientific paper in 2010 saying that it was very hard to implement community-based wildlife management in this region because of the distance and the uh, lack of communication between them and the lack of monitoring each other. That still holds true now, except that with the radio, we can communicate more. Everyone has a radio in their house and that's what they do when they're not working in the field is listening to the radio. So that allows them to, to be able to know what's happening and through the radio, they can also call meetings and mm -hmm. they are doing a lot more meetings now that they used to. Um, they also go to the towns when they need to sell an animal or two and then they get the news of what's happening. So they, they are more involved now in what's happening, mostly because of the radio and also the visits to the schools and the kids bringing information to the house. So this is like, that's, this is what's happening in their life now. It's like, they're taking our land, they're taking our forest, they're taking our animals. That's what's filling up their minds. Whereas 20 years ago when I started to work, it was not in their minds at all. Is, is the very nature of their getting organized a, a new cultural um, innovation or, or I don't know what to call it. Is that, yeah. is that new for them? Yeah, for the Kyojos, it's new. Their culture so is more like- They do it as a, as a daily practice. Yeah, they don't. But the Kyojos, are, it's new. Right. And in fact, if you see the, that pattern of spreading out in the forest, that's kind of also how they work, right? I have my family, my livestock, I need my space. And so that translates also in their social interactions. Mm. Whereas the Wichi work, live together in bigger settlements and every decision that they make has to be, has to go through a, a meeting and has to be approved by the elders. Um, so it's a different uh, like governance system that the different culture that the witchy have. So in a way with the witches uh, was easier for them to get organized. Meanwhile, Arthur Daniels Midland and, and Cargill can make some executive decision and have machinery there probably within a week or a few weeks. And gosh, it just seems like a, it seems like an unfair playing field to say the the most, the least. Yeah, totally. Um, one thing that the Wichi have done, I think I mentioned that, uh, this happened last year because they, they saw so many bulldozers 
coming in during the pandemic, they organized themselves. Our project Accumulator helped them and they form um, like a civil, I don't know how to call it, like a civil police force where they are like a guard. They are allowed to port to have guns and they can defend themselves. And so when they do see bulldozers, they, they are the ones who go and, and step in front of the bulldozers. Um, it's like a short, you know, it's not a long-term solution, but at least it's to give enough time for lawyers and the governments to work on property rights and all the bureaucracy too. That takes so much time. Thank you for that. Any other questions, comments? There is one in the in the text. Uh, I'll read it out, but and then I'll, I'll sort of translate it a little bit. How have the indigenous people controlled their population? Uh, for example, cultural views of family size, so they don't outnumber the environment. So it's really a question about the the long term sustainability of them of their of these communities prior to external forces coming in and doing massive deforestation. Mm -hmm. So maybe the yeah. real question is, you mentioned the hunting lifestyle, the subsistence lifestyle was sustainable. Uh, and is that, how did that, how was that? Mm -hmm. Well, historically, before the white people arrived, they were nomadic. And so they, all this Chaco region was there hunting and gathering. Um, fields. They have enough for everybody. Now that they are more restricted and it, you have several families living in, in small areas, they do over harvest, especially firewood. And so, yeah, they are overusing their environment because they are so restricted. And I think that I mentioned in one of the slides that the, the, the land holdings are not large enough for the viability of the communities. So the way that they manage is that the young people leave. The young men leave and go to the cities to try to find a job. Um, and, and you know that's what most communities, indigenous communities do when they are restricted in, in how much they can use from nature to survive. You had mentioned 250 hectares per family. That's about 650 acres. So this is one family with access to 650 acres uh, for a, a handful of cows or something. That's how impoverished the land is for, for that sort of usage. It's a rich environment for the native plants and animals, uh, but for external animals being brought in like cows and goats, it's not, it's, it's really impoverished. It's a, it's a difficult lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Right, and because they don't grow pastures for their livestock. The cows have to eat what they, whatever they can find in the forest. Sometimes they're even eating the bark of the trees, you know, because they're hungry and there's no grass. Um, at the end of the dry season, it's pretty bad. Many animals died and there's also not water. So um, that's, that's what makes the the environment not really suitable for livestock if they could have smaller numbers of cows um, but better managed in terms of sanitary management if they could have water to give them during the dry season then they could have the same amount of capital but with a small amount of livestock and less impact on the environment maybe an ngo or governmental effort to drink, dig some wells might be uh... except that the wall the water is salty <laughs> oh that's right or it has arsenic so <laughs> the livestock sometimes just dies from drinking water yeah no it would require to bring water from other places or huge harvest tanks during the rainy season right. big enough for that you know when the rains do fall yeah and that is happening some other organizations that we are collaborating with are working on finding uh, good containers that can hold the water from the rain throughout the rest of the year and containers that are not going to be ruined by the elements of the weather, by the strong sun and heat. So 
they're finding ways to bury these huge containers made with a special material that is going to be resistant. And that way they can save water from the rains for themselves and from cooking and also for, for their livestock. More questions? Um, Catherine asks in the chat, where does water come from for the commercial farms? Mm -hmm. So the commercial farms are doing uh, soybean and new GMO varieties of soy allow soy to grow in very dry environments. So that's why we see that the, the agriculture frontier is moving farther north into this area that is so dry that in the past you couldn't grow soy, but now you can. Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons why this region remains so isolated and out of everybody's minds for so long because it's so dry. But now it is worth a lot because you can actually grow soy and the land is still very, very cheap. Thank you for that. We have just a couple of minutes left, a few minutes left. Any last questions? Is Nature Conservancy going down there and buying up land? Or somebody no. like that? Um, yeah, the, the national park that was created right. was bought by um, the Land Trust, which is the organization that was created by um, Tompkins, Doug Tompkins. The, the Conservation uh, Land Trust, right? Yeah. Uh, and so he bought the land and donated it to the National Park System. But there's no Nature Conservancy efforts there? No. That's a blessing. Wow. Okay. Maybe there should be. There should be, yeah. Of all the places. Of all the places. It would, it would require a different approach, though, because they will have to buy the land and allow the locals to live there because we don't want more land that will displace locals. We want land that is protected, well managed, and where the locals are able to live their life. They're doing a lot of that. The last twenty years, they've they've taken on some really difficult communities, and you know the locals are running the organization there. So I think I think it would be. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have connections. I I have one. Okay. Send me an email. Well, yeah. well, well, well. And something that nobody asks about is like, this takes a lot of money. Yeah. That's part of what we do. It's just like, I'm writing proposals all the time, try to get money to fund all of our activities and to buy computers to give to these to the local wildlife monitors and get GPS and cameras and pay the people who go and do environmental education, uh, like Lysindo and Novo. So it does require a lot of mo money to have such project and it's hard to get money. Um, so that's what I do sometimes in my free time. <laughs> <laughs> So Mariana, I'm just coming to say congratulations, and I I had a conflicting event, so I'm so sorry I've missed, but I, I will say that I'm teaching advanced research design right now, and I am um, asking the students in that class to watch um, this presentation as an example of um, action research, and I hope everyone else, too, will encourage students and the community to, to reach in and watch these. Um, recordings. I'd like to, to to mirror that comment, Gretchen. That we've been we spend a lot of our faculty meetings talking about incorporating diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's a lot of implicit commentary that we need to be moving more interdisciplinarily, or uh, potentially even transdisciplinarily. And now we have an example, and thankfully recorded example of of the quintessential example of, of everything we're trying to accomplish. And this is an example that we already are accomplishing those things. Uh, we just need to inform one another because probably some high fraction of the faculty has no idea. So uh, yeah, I, I think it's worthwhile kind of sp spreading the word that 
These are great ideas. We need to 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 move and ever improve. And oh, by the way, we're already doing it in in uh, with at international uh, repute. And I'll I'll also say that on May second and third, um, there will be a a small meeting a, accompanying the PhD symposium on community engaged critical research. And soon um, there'll be some more information about how to participate in some of those sessions. And, and Marianne, I'm so excited to have you participate in that. And I think some of the questions that we'll be asking in this meeting are not just, um, I think we know that we should and we already are doing some of these things, but um, there'll be questions about how to build capacity in our institutions and also find uh, things like funding um, to support this type of work. So um, stay tuned for more information on that. And thank you so much, Mariana. Sure, thank you for organizing this. This, this is the idea, right? To meet each other. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if there's not any last comments, I think we're at the end. Thank you, Mariana, for a really wonderful presentation. I totally agree with Peter, this feels exactly at that intersection of things that we've been talking about um and i'm definitely furiously texting you know people i know being like this is something that we should be paying attention to um thank you for your wonderful work thank you thanks everyone who stayed all this long time sorry i went a little over time thank you thank you for allowing me to share my passion <laughs> All right, well, I hope everybody has a great day. We'll see you next month. Thank you for organizing this. Bye. Bye.